Tim was nominated by President Obama and unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate as North Dakota's 18th U.S. Attorney in August of 2010. Clay Jenkinson, humanities scholar and author and social commentator, has devoted most of his professional career to public humanities programs. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to thank Clay for, for working with me on this. We're going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to just talk back and forth, and it'll be a little bit more informal. Uh, I, when I was a young lawyer in North Dakota, uh, uh, I had an opportunity to go into the United States Attorney's Office in Fargo. Uh, and in the office in Fargo, which is in the federal building in the courthouse, it's in actually the old courthouse uh, that's on the National Historic Register of Historic Places, the courthouse where Gordon Call was tried, or Gordon Call and the, and the, the others involved in the Medina shooting were, were tried. It's a, it's a historic place. And on the wall there are there were, at that time, pictures of, of uh, 17 United States attorneys lined up the wall, going all the way back to black and white photos of people that, whose names exist on that wall only, but whose identity have been lost to history, I think. Um, and I thought to myself at the time, obviously, someday I'd like to see myself on that wall. And it was, uh, it was very important to me when my picture went up. But my picture is, and the other 18 pictures on the wall is not the most important picture in my office in Fargo. The most important picture in my office in Fargo is one that I hung. And that's the, the picture that I uh, personally purchased. I know we're under sequestration here, so let me be clear. I personally purchased with my own money and uh, uh, brought to Fargo with me on my trip from Bismarck hours after I'd been appointed uh, or sworn in as North Dakota's 18th United States Attorney. And in my office, I hung a photograph that was taken very shortly after this one. It shows the Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy, receiving uh, a headdress from a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe uh, and beco being, be being an becoming an honorary member of that tribe. And that photograph, like this one, was taken a mile and a half from here at the Grand Pacific Hotel on September 13, 1963, when Attorney General Kennedy came to North Dakota and gave the first of what would become many speeches, I think, on the plight of Native Americans and the challenges they faced. Uh, it was a story that I became familiar with, as you might imagine, uh, in the, in the uh, Justice Department at certain times in history. Bobby Kennedy is a revered figure. And for those of us that serve in the Department of Justice, he's somebody that you quickly want to learn more about. And this was a story I learned as I was waiting for my confirmation. I had lots of time to do things besides practice law. Uh, I had a chance to read Arthur Schlesinger's uh, biography of Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy and his times, and I read this great quote from Kennedy uh, uh, that he'd given at a speech uh, saying that uh, uh, the, the Native American was a victim of racial discrimination in his own land. I said, that's an interesting speech. And I flipped back to the footnote, and the footnote is, RFK, addressed before the National Congress of American Indians, Bismarck, North Dakota, September 16, 1963. RFK papers, RFK commencement address, Hartford College. And that set me on the path to want to learn more about this speech, to the recovery of these photographs, to hanging them on the wall in our office. That's a photograph that I'll leave behind when I, when I I'm no longer United States Attorney. So that's what led me to, to, to be interested in this speech. I'm going to toss it over to Clay. He's going to talk a little bit about Kennedy's life, I think the arc of his life, and how, how he came to be in Bismarck. Thanks. It's such an honor to be here. We're thrilled, and we appreciate being a small part of a, a really important conference. And I want to thank Merle Pavarud and, and particularly Kim Jondahl for giving us this opportunity. And Kim did archival work at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library in near Boston, and one of those documents proves to be a really extraordinary document, and she also managed to find film footage of Robert Kennedy's speech, his day in Bismarck in 1963, and so we appreciate everyone at the State Historical Society and the work that, that they're doing. This is a kind of an interesting day for me. Yesterday I was in Sydney, Montana, uh, where not so long ago the civil rights of Sherry Arnold were terminated uh, appallingly. And tomorrow I'm going to go out to Leith to join the ranks of the anti-supremacists at that horrible business. And so I think one of the, the things that we'll end with is that the, the arc of civil rights on the Great Plains is very far from uh, reaching its harmonious conclusion. And we use the word arc because of Martin Luther King's famous statement, which is getting a lot of play these days, the arc of the moral universe is long. 
but it bends towards justice. And that really characterizes John Kennedy and his brother Robert. They came late in the game of their lives to civil rights. Uh, they were reluctant to get involved in the civil rights movement. Really, the civil rights movement forced their involvement. Um, John Kennedy was never fully on board with it. Robert Kennedy evolved dramatically after the death of his brother, and that's something that we want to talk a little bit about today. So I'm just going to quickly catch you up. Robert Kennedy's dates, 1925 to June 6, 1968. Um, and this is really the, the story we want to tell. Mostly we're going to devote our remarks from 1963 to uh, June 1968. But there's a, the transformation of Robert Kennedy is one of the most interesting, I think, in American history. And, and just quickly, this is oversimplifying, but from 1925 to 1944, he was a pretty sad and lonely child. And we may think, well, he's the child of a rich, powerful family, but he was the seventh child. He had to repeat third grade. He was moved around to many schools in the course of that time. He was a C student. He never really got his father's attention. His father, Joe Kennedy, was fascinated mostly by his eldest son, Joe, and then by John F. Kennedy. And Robert really fell through the cracks in many ways. He had a, a close but not very emotionally satisfying relationship with his mother, Rose. And he says many times in the course of the period between 1963 and 1968 that he can empathize with young black children and young Indian children and young Hispanic children because he was a lonely child. And he says, I realize I'm a rich, lonely child, but that doesn't mean that I don't understand your plight. Then his formal education between 1944 and 1951, Harvard, followed by the University of Virginia Law School. Then this sort of sets up the story from 1952, when he managed his brother's first Senate campaign in Massachusetts until November 22nd, 1963, or a little after that, he essentially lived for Jack Kennedy. And I, and I don't think you can actually exaggerate that thought. He literally gave his life during those years to his brother. And he was, in many respects, Jack Kennedy's dark side, his enforcer, the bad cop, the one who delivered the bad news, who fired people, who dressed people down, who did the ruthless things that needed to be done. The one that Joe Kennedy described as, Bobby's like me, he hates like me. Yeah, Joe Kennedy said he's the best hater in the family. Right. So, so during this period, although he got married in 1951, long before his more famous brother, and had a lot of children, um, he was really living for Jack. And with the death of John Kennedy on November 22, 1963, a chasm opened in Robert Kennedy's life. And it's an extraordinary story of the dark night of the soul. He barely turned up at the Justice Department. People would spend two hours with him, and he would be just vacantly staring into space. He read the great classical authors, Aeschylus and Sophocles and Homer, and he read Camus and Sartre. And he really had a, a profound crisis of the spirit, grief, bewilderment, loss of identity, survivor's guilt, etc. And he didn't really emerge from it until around 1965. And then in 1965, he had been elected to the United States Senate from New York in 1964. He suddenly emerges as the tribune for the downtrodden, the tribune for the underclass in America, including Native Americans. And it's one of the strangest, it's one of the strangest phenomena that you can see. He belongs to a very small group of people that includes Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King and Gandhi, but not Churchill and not Jack Kennedy. It's a small group of people who somehow, for whatever reason, come to incorporate into their own lives some sense of the suffering of humanity and, and make themselves available in things that other people would regard as degradation. And towards the end of his life, in the reckless last three months, I mean, he was doing things, it's hard, it's not really best to call it reckless, it's more, and it's not a death wish, but he exposed himself and almost, I'm mean, using this term very, cautiously, but almost in a Christ-like way to crowds. The crowds were so huge, and he was part Messiah and part rock star at this period, and the crowds would be so huge, he'd be standing on the back of an open convertible. And if you would just think, I mean, why would any Kennedy ever be in a convertible 
again after November 22nd, and he, his aides would be holding his calves, and people, women and, and men, young and old, people of all colors would come up and tear at his cufflinks and try to grab locks of his hair and rip his, literally rip his shirt off, take his shoes. He would come away from these encounters bloody and gnarled and having lost, he finally stopped wearing gold cufflinks because he lost so many in the course of this period. And so there's some strange thing that's going on that's, that's almost beyond human analysis. And so quickly, let me just show a few slides. Here he is in the period with Jack. This is, of course, a famous and iconic photograph during the Cold War. But listen to this. He says this about his interest in civil rights. Honestly, before I became Attorney General, I didn't give a shit about civil rights. It never touched my life. Think of that. This is, of course, the image at the funeral. And uh, look what Evan Thomas, one of his best biographers, says. Some believe that RFK had so invested himself in his brother's life that a part of him had died with the president. Evan Thomas says, in time, RFK would outgrow his brother. He would come closer than JFK ever did to the myth of moral visionary that Bobby and Jackie worked so assiduously to create after the death of John Kennedy. And George McGovern of South Dakota, who knew a fair amount about Native Americans, I think he became more thoughtful and more perceptive and sensitive after the death of his brother. I think it was time for him to come to terms with himself in a way that he hadn't before. And so let me just stop there, and I'm going to turn it back to Tim, but I just want to speculate for a minute about the death of John Kennedy. In a strange way, the death of President Kennedy in November 1963 liberated his brother. I can think of four ways. First, for all of this time, he had been Jack's alter ego, and he had really subordinated his own mental and, and heart growth to protecting his brother in every possible way. And so he had sort of put his life on hold to serve this other man, and suddenly that ended. And secondly, Jack Kennedy, as you'll see if you come to the big symposium we're holding right in this room on November 5th, 6th, and 7th, John Kennedy was famously detached. He was cool. He was emotionally distant, even to people who knew him well. He, 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 he got involved in the civil rights movement with, with, with extraordinary emotional detachment. It was really his brother Robert who was pushing him. It was Robert who pushed him to give that famous television speech in the summer of 1963. And so John's detachment was something that Robert Kennedy didn't dare thwart and in some ways tried to em emulate. And third, John Kennedy actually chided and jibed at his brother for his passions over civil rights. He made a joke out of it, and sometimes an aggressive joke, and saying, you're gonna, you're gonna hurt me politically. And that's the fourth issue, that up until the death of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy had to calculate everything he did so as not to hurt his brother's future. And that meant that he was extraordinarily self-disciplined through that period, because they were in deep concern that John Kennedy would lose the election of 1964 because of their civil rights activities. And in fact, the trip to Dallas was in some respects a trip to try to, to test the waters in a relatively safe southern state to see how d badly they had been damaged by their cautious work on civil rights between 1962 and the autumn of 1963. And so that takes us to the moment that Tim's going to pick up here. Here's a photograph from that great day in Bismarck, and here's, here's what Kim Jondal found at the JFK Library. There's a letter from the National Congress of American Indians to the Attorney General of the United States inviting him to come out to North Dakota to give the speech, and his aides didn't want him to do it. That will be a theme that follows him for the rest of his life. His aides were always saying, there's nothing in it. There, there's no, there are no votes in Indians. There's no, you, you gain nothing by attending to Indians. In fact, you lose something by paying attention to Native Americans. And he scribbles at the top of this marvelous letter that he got from the National Congress. It's a hell of a long way to go, but I like Indians. And so he came. He came. So let's, let's ground this visit in September 13, 1963, 
into uh, uh, in the immediate history of that era. So John Ke uh, Robert Kennedy had been Attorney General uh, uh, of the United States. He'd, he'd taken office shortly after Jack was sworn in in uh, January 19. 61, uh, had been at the department a couple of years, uh, uh, was uh, deep into his uh, 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 relationship, his uh, mutual dis dislike with J. Edgar Hoover, uh, those sorts of things. But let's, let's uh, September 13, 1963, it's one year since Bobby Kennedy's Justice Department stood with James Meredith when he attempted to enter Old Miss and was met with a hail of glass bottles and stones and bullets. Uh, that experience left a, a, a remark on Kennedy that shortly thereafter in the, in the depth of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when, when he was told that the missiles in Cuba could reach the continental United States, he wondered aloud if they had the range to reach Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, uh, it, 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 uh, this, the trip to Bismarck comes three months after the department, Bobby Kennedy's Department of Justice stood against Governor George Wallace as he stood in the schoolhouse door and denied entrance to the University of Alabama to, to several African Americans attempting to enroll there, including a woman named, Sher named Vivian Malone, who's the sister of a woman named Sharon Malone, who's the wife of Attorney General Eric Holder. This visit to Bismarck in September 63 came three months after the death of Edgar Evers, and it came mere weeks after the March on Washington and Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech. And so Bobby Kennedy, despite the long distance, <laughs> got on an airplane, and flew to Bismarck, went to the Grand Pacific Hotel, and he said, and we're going to call up the first piece of video we have, uh, uh, the Indian may be free. I think he can hear me. I think he's going to play video. We'll see. Cue the video. Cue the video. Or to leave it. To take part in state and federal government. But that freedom amounts to precious little when he must struggle every day against heavy odds to feed and clothe and shelter his family. Can we, can he we may be technically free, start but he is the victim and may be technically free to vote to stay on his reservation or to leave it, to take part in state and federal government. But that freedom amounts to precious little when he must struggle every day against heavy odds to feed and clothe and shelter his family. He may be technically free, but he is the victim of social and economic oppressions that hold him in bondage. He is all too likely to become the victim of his own proud anger his own frustrations, and the most humiliating of all, the victim of racial discrimination in his own land. So these remarks by Kennedy about the poverty, the, the, the words he uses, poverty, undereducation, and disease, uh, as he discusses the reservations, has to be taken, I think, in the light of what he was dealing with on a daily basis as the Attorney General. Uh, he was dealing on a daily basis for a year, a year and a half, with the legal consequences of Brown versus Board of Education and the Supreme Court cases that came and the integration battles of the South. And, and, and again, this had not been something he had focused on as a young man or, or in his career with this, uh, supporting the it was, thrust, it was thrust upon him and he, he answered the call. And so I think that while that is not a statement about civil rights, uh, I think it, we can very easily link it to the idea that, that uh, the fundamental civil right is the right that we all, most of the people in this room, I think, well, I shouldn't say that. It's a right that I took for granted. And that's the right that if you work hard and play by the rules, you can advance in this society as, high, as, as far as your hard work and talent will take you. It's something that many of us in North Dakota take for granted, I believe, uh, and, and something that we should think about in the context of civil rights. And so I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. We, we have this idea that we have the, uh, the discussion of the poverty and the, and the burdens facing uh, Native Americans at that time. Uh, we have a couple more snippets of video. I think now's the time to play them. Can we play the, uh, the, the uh, presentation of the headdress video? Here we go. Tonight, I think he's going. 
particularly love the uh, the vines on the on the on the on the girding behind it. I mean, the, the Grand Pacific Hotel must have been something to see in 1963. Um, so uh, again, that that's the headdress uh, uh, awarding. There was actually two headdresses awarded that day, or worn one at the airport, one at the Grand Pacific Hotel. Uh, uh, Kennedy received a number of gifts from tribes that day. At one point, he uh, as he's receiving gifts, he wonders aloud how many Indian tribes are there because it's been going on so long. Um, and then I, we have a last piece of video, which is more civil rights specific. It links into what we've been talking about at Old Miss in Alabama. This is a press conference, impromptu press conference, given at the governor's mansion, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, in which Kennedy discussed what's going on in, in the rest of the country. So we'll play that last clip. for civil rights, uh, which involves the Negro now, because that's the largest minority group, is uh, not just on behalf of the Negro, it's but on behalf of all minority groups that have been denied their rights and uh, who are subject to injustices because of their color or their racial background. And I think that includes Eskimos, includes the Indians, includes the uh, Latin Americans, who uh, in some parts of our country have the equivalent only of a third year education. It includes in some areas of the country uh, Chinese and Japanese. But I think the focus of attention is on Negroes now because of the large numbers of Negroes spread all across the country and people are much more aware of it. But I think that this effort has to be made on behalf of all these groups. And I don't think that we're meeting our responsibilities if we just do it as far as the Negroes are concerned. So there we have the linkage, I think, uh, uh, of Kennedy talking about civil rights in terms of poverty and, and disease and deprivation uh, rather than, well, you know, uh, the, the, the more refined or, or focused areas of, well, you know, can, can you go vote? Uh, can, can you go to school? I mean, he, he's looking at it, I think, from a, a broader uh, uh, viewpoint uh, that, that certainly we need to protect those rights, but in the end, it's the poverty and the disease and the isolation that robs you of the true civil right, which is the ability to, to fulfill the American dream. And, and we're reading a lot into a couple of video clips, but of course we have the campaign of 1968 uh, as, as proof of our hypothesis, and I think Clay's going to talk about, about that at this point, the, the last campaign. Let me just pick up this conversation. This is a 37-year-old man who was here in Bismarck, North Dakota. This little 37-year-old man, think of yourself at 37. And he's the Attorney General of the United States, in addition to which he's the principal advisor to his brother, the President of the United States, and the father of a dozen children. <laughs> he takes this on when he doesn't have to. That's the point. He didn't have to make the long trip to North Dakota. He didn't have to let Indians be more than a nominal part of his portfolio. In fact, Everything about his background would have led one to believe that he could have lived his entire life without becoming concerned about the plight of Native Americans. Can I read the quote from Ramsey Clark? Sure. Uh, so Kennedy became uh, Attorney General, and uh, 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 there was a division in the Attorney General's office, uh, the uh, 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 Lands Division. The Lands Division. It's probably about as exciting as it sounds, right? So uh, he had little regard for that. Ramsey Clark. Uh, I believe went on to become Attorney General himself, he did. Uh, was, was, uh, was the head of the Lands Division. But uh, Kennedy became uh, 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 interested when he found out that Ramsey Clark had Indians, which is how they put it in the book here. Um, and, and so they had been involved in litigation, mostly you know, trying to not give land back to the tribes. Kennedy and Clark said, well, let's do the opposite, which led to some backlash. And there were several senators that said, that's not what we want to do, including uh, uh, Robert Kerr from, uh, from Oklahoma objected to a property settlement with the Cherokee Nation, uh, and, and Ramsey Clark said this, Bob didn't have much patience with that because his primary instincts were not legal but humanitarian. Kennedy said, for God's sakes, we owe it to the Cherokees, and don't worry about the niceties. He felt that we had pushed uh, them, the Indians, around, and he said so. Uh, um, Clark used to wonder why Kennedy cared so much. He may have had some specific experience with Indians that I don't know about, Clark said, but finally decided that he just had this burning passion to help people who had been denied justice. So where does that come from, Clay? That's the, that's the question. Well, that's what we don't really know. Right. 
Um, that's what we're speculating about. And by the way, the book on this subject has yet to be written, and it needs to be written. We combed all of the literature on Robert Kennedy to find what little fragments we could, and there are tantalizing suggestions, but nobody has really honed in on this question. I think it would be a marvelous PhD dissertation or a monograph, but uh, Robert Kennedy and Native Americans is a fascinating subject. He came to North Dakota twice per Indians, once in 1963. We've just shown you those clips. He also came in 1966 as a United States Senator. And interestingly, as a United States Senator, he, he said, I want to be, form a subcommittee on Indians. And he really didn't have that portfolio, and the, the system was very different then, so a Senator couldn't really choose what she or he wanted to focus on. But he talked another Senator into letting him do a subcommittee on Native Americans, and he traveled the country to reservations examining conditions and giving speeches much like the one that he had given here in September of 1963. And he then came back in 1966 for his second visit, and he went, I think, back to Standing Rock, and he went to a school, an Indian school, a BIA school. He said, show me in your curriculum what it has to say about Indians. And the principal got the history book and showed him, and the only discussion in the history of the United States about Indians in this book was a, an illustration of a scalping and Kennedy flew into a rage and said, A, this should never be in a book alone, but B, is this what you're teaching young Native Americans about their culture? And so his passion, one of the things that all of his biographers say is that he was a morally righteous man. He saw the world in black and white, good and evil, yes and no. And when he got on to something, when he saw an injustice with his own eyes, he became impassioned about it and he saw injustice in North Dakota and Arizona and South Dakota and elsewhere. And once he had seen it, he could not let it go. And it became one of the central passions of his life. I think it, it's really fair to say he had more of his heart engaged in Native American justice than in African American justice. He was dutiful on the African American front, but he was really deeply committed. And, and just listen to this. He went as Attorney General to Chicago, and they wanted to send a limousine to pick him up. The FBI did. And this comes from a field agent. And the cable to Director Her Herbert Hoover, or J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI's top man in Chicago noted that Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, had turned down a chauffeured limousine provided by a leading Chicago industrialist. Kennedy said he wanted to ride with FBI agents in their car. He asked to be given a tour of the slum areas of Chicago and was shown low-cost housing projects, boys' clubs, integrated schools, and playgrounds. And the agent continues, appeared to indicate dissatisfaction with youth development here. <laughs> and so he did this all of his life. When he went to South America in 1966, they had a tour planned where you go to a you know, carefully staged dinners and banquets and so on. He refused it and he went into the barrios some barrios that they told him that he would be unsafe in. He plunged himself into crowds. He went to a stadium where there were communists who hated the United States and therefore him, and he was warned that the, that the South American authorities could not guarantee his safety. He went and confronted them. They spat on him and threw things at him. But in the end, they came to respect him because he had done this. We'll end with South Africa, where he went and plunged into the world of apartheid when he was warned not only by South Africa not to do it, by our own State Department tried to, to stop him from doing it. One of his uh, biographers says, on the long, this is when he became a senator from New York, and, and he really was a, a carpetbagger. He was a, uh, from Massachusetts, and he hadn't lived in New York for most of his life. So then he got to know New York, and it said, on the long drive from the airport, on the tours of the slums, on visits to his constituents, Bobby became aware in a way that he had not been before of the city's evils, of its blackened tunnels, its dilapidated schools, its terrible housing projects, its dirt, its stink, its careless brutalities, its grotesque violence, its congestion, its filth, its danger and purposelessness. Those are all his terms. His very appre appreciation of the sun-washed brightness of the old Hellenic poetry he was reading was directly confronted by what he saw as the plight of urban poverty in the most wealthy nation on earth. And the author concludes by saying, the world of the Greek poets had, of course, also been filled with pain and suffering, but it at least had been free of rat shit. <laughs> you know, and so he becomes, this is one of the few men who grows in office. Most people right. are diminished in office. He grows in the court right. of the Senate. And he, he, he uh, through his work it, 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 with, 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 in the Native American context, is really the, 
the herald of the change from the assimilation era to the self-determination era. Uh, it, it'll be a decade or so before uh, legislation and, and uh, 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 the Nixon administration will, will end some of the uh, assimilation policies and begin anew with the current era we're in of, of self-determination. And obviously, uh, we've had over the last, I mean, when you think that the Attorney General was in Bismarck 50 years ago talking about the plight of poverty in the reservation, it would be great now to say, well, in the last 50 years, look where we've come. But uh, that is not something we can say. Um, over the last three years as the United States Attorney for North Dakota, um, one of our priorities has been with the Department of Justice as we, as we attempt to move the self-determination far, era farther on the reservations in North Dakota is simply to make people uh, feel, on the, who live on the reservations, to feel secure in their, in their neighborhoods and homes. Uh, we can't expect people to, to, to uh, uh, advance and work towards their potential if they live in a community where a Native American female baby has a one in three chance of being sexually assaulted in their lifetime, where, where Indian women suffer domestic violence at rates that would be unacceptable, that are unacceptable in any community, but would be met with howling outrage if they occurred in Bismarck. Um, we've, we've uh, the, the, the necessity of additional funding, additional, additional law enforcement officers, additional prosecutors to address that issue uh, was heard early in, in this administration and additional resources were devoted. We, had, we, re, we announced department-wide uh, last spring that over a four-year period the number of violent criminals uh, cases brought, to tri brought charges in Indian country in the United States was up 54 percent from 2009 to 2013 or 2012, something like that. So uh, the first step uh, to, to, to implementing uh, Kennedy and to, uh, to Kennedy's vision and to, to giving tribes the ability to fully exercise self-determination is honoring some of our treaty obligations and providing safe communities. And so that's the role that was, Kennedy was the Attorney General. He had a narrow role when it came to Native Americans. He exceeded that. By far, he, he, yeah. excited that. he exceeded his portfolio, as they would say. He got outside of his lane. Um, but uh, today, the Department of Justice, we look at it two ways, uh, public safety and civil rights. Uh, and of course, I like to blend the two and say that public safety is a civil right. So that is uh, uh, an important part of this, too, is the switch that was sort of engendered over the next decade of the assimilation policies to the self-determination policies, which is the, really the seminal shift in, in native uh, uh, Anglo relations in the country in the past hundred years. And so, I mean, one, just a couple of things about that, and I'll show a little from 1968. But Tim, I looked this up the other day. You know, we think of the American Indian movement and the uh, and the cultural revolution of the 1960s in America, but it really came. It was, it was starting to percolate in Indian country at the time, but it came a little bit later after his death. For example, some of the key texts, Fine Deloria's um, Custer Died for Your Sins, 1970, um, D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, 1970, Little Big Man, the film that mm -hmm. caused a lot of stir, 1971, the crying Indian on the um, Beautify America ads, 1971 and 2. So these things were percolating, but he was ahead of the curve on many of them, again, taking on a cause that was not yet forcing his hand. Right. And, and he was so far ahead of the curve, Clay, of course, that in 1968, uh, his advisors were, were in the back, back rooms tearing their hair out as they had appointments scheduled in for him and speeches to give in, in places like Rapid City and, and Sioux Falls, and he wanted to go to Wounded Knee in Pine Ridge. Now, let me show you a couple of those. They're so interesting. Um, he says this, by the way, and, and this was not in his speech in Bismarck, but in 1967, the inexcusable and ugly deprivation which causes young Indians to commit suicide on their reservations because they've lacked all hope and they feel they have no future, a, 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 a concern that's of much greater public importance now than it was then, but he was a pioneer in this. 1968 campaign, this is exactly what you're talking about, Tim, 82 days. He got in late after um, McCarthy had nearly defeated Johnson in the New Hampshire primary after the Tet Offensive and after Johnson finally withdrew. In that campaign of 82 days, there were 70 events and um, 10 of them took place on Indian reservations and it drove his advisors nuts. Um, and there's one of them. Kennedy insisted on a two hour flight uh, to Window Rock, Arizona under very difficult conditions and then they, I've, I've done this. People, there was no runway, so they just parked trucks on either end. I, I have not done that. To land at night. And one of his aides said, when he was throwing up in that plane, we're in a campaign. 
and you should knock off the Indians. And Kennedy couldn't talk. He had laryngitis. He had spoken so many times. He said, those of you who think you're running my campaign don't love Indians the way I do. You're a bunch of bastards. <laughs> then he gets to Window Rock, Arizona, and he sees just horrible things. Um, this, for one, the, the, the boarding school system, is it not barbaric to take children as young as five and send them a thousand miles from their families to a boarding school? And then he met two young Indians who couldn't go home for Christmas. There was, they, they live across the country and they couldn't go home for Christmas. And he said, when the United States can spend 130 million a year on Indian education, but does not have enough money to send a child home for Christmas, then something is pretty bad. And here he is, I want you to tell this story. He, he, he's in the middle of the fight for his life. If he does not win the California and Oregon primaries, he's done. And he decides to contest South Dakota, even though McGovern is South Dakota, Humphrey was born in South Dakota, McCarthy has South Dakota roots. His advisors are saying there are no electoral votes in South Dakota. You can't win it. The favorite sons are going to win. Why would you want to go to South Dakota whatsoever? And, and I believe uh, this is in the Pine Ridge Reservation. Right. And I believe, Clay, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a connection here to the, to the uh, Red Cloud Indian School at Pine Ridge, which, which still exists and which I've toured and which is a beacon of hope. Uh, uh, on, on that reservation. Uh, uh, here he is with Christopher Pr Pretty Boy. Uh, Pretty Boy was in the crowd that day uh, at Pine Ridge, which again was a, a scene, as Clay has described, of, of chaos and, and, and crowds and, and uh, people physically uh, uh, getting to Kennedy to touch him. Uh, and, 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 and Kennedy attached himself, or Pretty Boy attached himself to Kennedy, and they spent the day together. They went into a room. Went into a room. Exactly. And, 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 and again, Pretty Boy accompanied him across the reservation. And so we have this iconic picture of course, we know today that within a year, both of these gentlemen would be dead. Kennedy would be assassinated, and Pretty Boy died, died shortly thereafter. As I recall, there's some, there's, there's an extra degree of, of, of sadness here, and that people aren't even really sure what happened. Right, it may have been an accident, car accident, but he, both of them were dead. But he, here he is in the, in the middle of this unbelievably hectic campaign when he needs to be in the state of California, and he flies to Rapid City, and gets himself down to Wounded Knee. He went to Wounded Knee that day. Yes, he went to Wounded Knee that day and, uh, uh, in 68. Uh, and uh, and if, if you haven't visited the Wounded Knee site in South Dakota, you should. Uh, um, it is a Amazing. moving place to be. Um, and, and Kennedy went uh, to the monument uh, of the massacre and uh, stated as he was leaving with his advisors, you know, I, you know, I think probably browbeating some, some handler, we should have brought flowers. Well, I had the privilege uh, in the summer of 19, or excuse, excuse me, in the summer of 2011, to uh, visit the Wounded Knee Memorial with 30 United States attorneys, whose districts include Indian Country, uh, and Attorney General Holder, who brought a wreath of flowers, and with the chairman of the stand of the Pine Ridge Sioux Tribe, the Pine Ridge the Ogallala Tribe, placed those flowers on the Wounded Knee Memorial. Um, that's not something you'll ever forget. Uh, uh, when I think about my career as U.S. Attorney and the things that I'll remember, I can't imagine what's at the top of the list, but that's pretty close. Um, and, and so again, I want to I veer slightly off script here, and I want to uh, riff on something that was said earlier uh, when, when Dr. Roberts was speaking about uh, one of the questions he sometimes gets uh, as he talks about his experience in, in Little Rock is, well, how long did it take then after that initial hubbub about y'all attending school before the, the, the classroom settled down and, and the white students accepted you and y'all just went on with your education? Um, it, when I think about, about Christopher Pretty Boy and, and what life was like in Pine Ridge in 1968 and I compare with what I saw in White Clay uh, in, in 2011, which was not doesn't appear to have been much progress there. Um, and I think about uh, a couple of other things. I think about the, uh, the, the, the photo that hangs in the tribal council chambers in, Fort, in, in Newtown of, uh, of tribal chairman Gillette weeping as the Pick Sloan administrative rules are signed and, and he realizes what's about to come for Elbow Woods and Nishu and places like that. And this week I was fortunate enough to be in Hood River, Oregon with 20 of my colleagues meeting with the Columbia River Tribes on salmon fishing rights and, and criminal jurisdiction and some of the in-lieu sites there. And tribal elders told the, the tale of less than 40, 50 years ago, the Dalles Dam Reservoir silencing the Celilo Falls as the water went up and the primary salmon fishing place for the Yakima, the Nez Perce, the Warm Springs, and the Umatilla under that water.
those traumas are less than a generation removed. They're not ancient. They're not ancient. Uh, they're not ancient for the tribal chairman or the tribal council at Newtown when they look every day in their tribal council chambers at Chairman Gillette with his head in his hands. They're not ancient for the tribal chairman at Yakima when he talks about his grandfather being present, uh, or his, excuse me, not his grandfather, his father being present as the Celilo Falls fell silent. Um, we tend to forget. We tend to talk about a post-racial society. Uh, I think that, that you have to understand that many of these traumas uh, are not ancient history. Can I say that carefully enough? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Now, this, let me just finish this little piece of it. So, he, if he doesn't win California, it's over. If he wins California, he may still not be the Democratic nominee, but he cannot be the Democratic nominee without winning California. So he comes to South Dakota. and the. The primary elections were on the same day, June 4th, 1968. And I just read this the other day, and I just burst into tears. The, virtually the last call he ever took the evening, just before he went down into the ballroom at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, virtually the last telephone conversation he ever had was with George McGovern. And McGovern called to congratulate him on winning South Dakota. Somehow he won South Dakota in spite of the fact that it was Hubert Humphrey's birthplace. Maybe there were some votes on the reservation. <laughs> and McGovern told him that he got almost 100% of the Indian vote in South Dakota and 100% in a number of precincts. And Kennedy was so gratified by that, that mattered more to him than winning South Dakota. And an hour later, he's assassinated. So the period we're talking about between 1963 and June 6, 1968, when in fact he died, is a period where Native American issues and African American issues and Hispanic American issues dominated his thinking. Right. Kennedy, of course, uh, 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 I'm sure I, we're going to talk about this, uh, during Chavez's hunger strike goes to, goes to California. Yeah, let me show you that picture here. Um, here I'm just, these are some pictures of Kennedy in the last days of his life, and they're just marvelous and heartbreaking. This is as characteristic a photograph as you will ever see of that period. This is That's my favorite of all of them. The, I guess reckless is the term you have to use. Here he is with Cesar Chavez. He, he, Chavez went on a hunger strike and a long one and broke it and Kennedy chose to suspend his travels and to fly out to Fresno and to go to be with him and uh, Chavez broke his hunger strike by taking the mass, having a single wafer of Christ's body and Robert Kennedy was advised by everybody to stay out of this. And when he got out there he was told by a local sheriff that they were pre-arresting people so that they wouldn't riot. Yeah. And Kennedy said, I can't do his accent, but he said, I wonder if you've ever read the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> Pre-arrest pre is, a, I guess, term of art, I guess. Pre-arrest and potential yeah. rioters. And so here again, there was nothing in it for him to take on Cesar Chavez. And uh, they liked each other. There was sort of an improbable friendship. And one of the things that, you know, when you think about the story, Tim, rich white guy taking on minority questions, and so there's a certain level of potential skepticism about that. But he had the ability to win the hearts of people who should have been suspicious of him and initially were. There are famous incidents of when James Baldwin had a group of African Americans in Robert Kennedy's um, apartment on, in, um, in, New York City. in New York City, and they just worked him over right. for three and a half hours right. mercilessly. And just shouting at him, several walked out and said that he was a horrible white man and he, was, he symbolized all the problems of America and he, he got defiant, but he turned them around because they realized, A, he was willing to listen and B, he was willing to act. Yeah. I think it is the action too. I mean, you, 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 have, to, you have to go, you have to listen, you, you have to... Uh, you have to learn, understand that every day this is not your trauma, this is not you, this is the people you're talking to, you have to listen and learn. And then you have to talk, you have to be able to have a dialogue, but at some point there has to be action. And, and you have to have deliverables. If you're going to, if you're going to help uh, uh, move the cause, move, the, uh, move the, 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 the curve of history, 
Uh, talk is not enough. And, and Kennedy, uh, you know, delivered in terms of, of raising the profiles of these issues and, and certainly in terms of the civil rights movement in the South. I mean, it was a matter of there were schools that were not integrated that after he was attorney general were integrated. And so those, those are important as well. Many of you are aware, probably, that, that recently the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, has announced some new, uh, new uh, ways to move forward in terms of, of crime in the country. We've reached a point where, where uh, uh, there's a political opportunity because of the costs associated with the incarcerations uh, that we have. That there's an opportunity to, uh, to take another look at how we're doing things. And, and uh, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, in addition to enforcement, we're also working with communities for, to support viable crime prevention programs, and most importantly, with reentry. It's a large part of what the Attorney General has to say. 95% of violent criminals that get locked up in the federal system, what happens to them? 95% of them come home at some point. And we have to do a better job of, of helping those folks. And, and so tying this in, and this, this idea of tying together uh, uh, public safety, poverty, and civil rights. I'm going to read to you uh, from an op-ed that was written by one of my colleagues uh, whose district couldn't be more unlike our district. He's in the Western District of Virginia in Roanoke. Uh, he has uh, a very different uh, uh, demographic of folks and, and issues that he faces, but one of the big issues he faces is, is violent crime in his, some of these communities. And his name is Tim Heafy. Uh, he uh, is a friend of mine, and, and I saw this op-ed that he'd written, and I can only give it the ultimate compliment. I said, God, I wish I would have written that, because it's exactly right. And here's what Heafy says uh, in terms of his di district, but which I I think is directly applicable to the work we're trying to do here in North Dakota in Indian country. And he wrote this on the anniversary of the uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech in, in uh, Washington. And, and he writes, uh, while, today's world, while today's world is demonstrab demonstrably more just than it was in 1963, we cannot credibly claim that we have a claim to have, to have achieved King's dream of an equal opportunity society. Today in America, too many people live in communities in which they encounter violence, drug addiction, and other forms of criminality on a daily basis. Poor people in communities large and small, urban and rural, are disproportionately impacted by crime, disease, and other destructive forces that prevent their realization of King's dream. Rather than being free to pursue happiness, they are caught in a cycle of poverty, deprivation, and despair. And this is the line that hits me here in North Dakota. To truly achieve the ideal of justice articulated by King, we must collectively recognize public safety as a fundamental civil right. And as I think about uh, uh, Dr. Roberts' speech, uh, uh, Representative Boucher's speech, and I think about the work, uh, in the words of Kennedy 50 years ago, and the work that we do here in the U.S. Attorney's Office in North Dakota on the reservations, again, until all Americans African American, gay American, Native American, feel safe in their home and community, how can we expect them to reach their American dream, even if they do work hard and play by the rules? And so we're committed to that. We're committed. I'm committed to the ideal that, that uh, whether it's my daughter in Bismarck or a gay teenager in West Fargo or, or, or a young uh, Lakota girl in, in Cannonball, they all have the civil right to a safe community and opportunity to reach their potential. So we have a long ways to go. 50 years is a long time. We've made some progress, but we have a long way to go. I think we should take some questions. Well, let me just, I'm, I'm, I'll uh, set you up for this 1966 okay. piece. There are three short passages about Kennedy during these last years. This is by Michael Barron, who has a, a wonderful monograph called The Last Aristocrat. With his hair perpetually askew, his necktie loosened, his shirt sleeves rolled up, and his horn-rimmed glasses pushed high up on his head. Bobby was a, as natural and unselfconscious an aristocrat as his brother was a studied one. <laughs> Bobby took for his models the men he saw around him. Jack took for his the men he read about in books. Then he goes on, on a few pages later. And this is about that ambivalence we feel about the rich man in the slum. This Bobby the passionate pilgrim, the earnest seeker, the Bobby whom we so easily picture walking along a desolate western airport tarmac against a background of great mountains with his little dog or kneeling in the midst of a remote orange grove with Mr. Chavez and a group of migrant farm workers or bending to grasp the hand of one of the little children with whom, like the Lord, he felt such instinctive sympathy. This Bobby is familiar enough to us 
It is the Bobby whose purity, whose compassion, and whose peculiar sweetness of nature made him seem like a secular saint. But we are suspicious. We Americans do not trust secular saints. And then just one more from Baron, but via Jack Newfield, one of his key aides. Bobby grew up, says Newfield, with cardinals, movie stars, diplomats, and financiers. But he was killed reaching for the hand of a $75 a week Mexican dishwasher. Think of that. He was killed reaching for the hand of a $75 a week Mexican dishwasher. Baron says, Newfield implies that there is something singular in this. But of course the phenomenon of aristocratic statesmen sympathizing with the cause of the downtrodden is at least as old as the Gracchi in ancient Rome. Bobby, however, went further than any other major American statesman of his era to mitigate, not simply to mitigate the pain of the poor and the powerless, but to feel it in himself. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. So uh, I came across some remarks uh, of Kennedy's. They're famous remarks. I'm not, it's not like I discovered these. Uh, what was interesting for me, I told Ke uh, Keith, or Keith, I told Clay, uh, this is from a speech uh, that, that Bobby Kennedy gave in Cape Town, South Africa. And the date of the speech was June 6, 1966. That happens to be the day my parents got married. Even more importantly, it's the day that my long-suffering wife, Carmen Miller, was born. So for me, when I see 6666, that's an important day. And to see that this, uh, uh, these words were spoken on that day, the coincidence of that is too astounding to believe. So let me just close with, with this from the Day of Affirmation speech. Few of us will have the greatness to bend history, but each one of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of these acts will be written the history of our generation. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a person stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injusti injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I think that says it all. I think that says it all in terms of what can we do? What can you do? And I always end with a call to action. The folks in this room can help us, of course, at the Department of Justice and help us in North Dakota uh, uh, improve the lot, improve the civil rights of those neighbors of ours only 45 minutes away. We are only 680,000 people in North Dakota. That's the size of Louisville, Kentucky. We are one community. And these, these challenges that face our, our Indian brothers and sisters are not isolated. They should not be isolated. They should be born and outrageous to every North Dakotan. There's a lot of talent in this room. Think about today, what can you do? What can you do to improve the lot of the 14-year-old girl in Lakota or the gay teenager in West Fargo? What can you do? So you know, I think we'll take two, some questions. Two, well, two things about yeah. that. One is that when he went to South Africa in 1966, yeah. South Africa refused to greet him at the airport. Um, he had to take private car, a taxi, into Cape Town because uh, he was regarded as persona non grata <laughs> I'm by the um, South African apartheidists. And so he made his own way and gave that speech and met with several banned individuals during the course of that. And then, of course, finally, as you can see in this horrible, ho terrible photograph, his civil rights were terminated when he was just a young man on the night of June 4th. 1968 in um, Los Angeles. I remember where I was when I heard the news. Uh, Tim, you're probably too young for that sort of thing. I was born in December of 1968. So, so I'm going to remove that photograph because yeah. I hate it. Any questions? I think that's we're going to roll into questions. Yeah, we have about 22 minutes, so if there are questions, we can uh, do some of those. Was Bobby Kennedy educated in a Catholic school or a public school? He went mostly to public schools. He was moved around a lot because the, the family moved to England for a time. Uh, his father was the ambassador to the court of James, um, of St. James, and he also uh, went to uh, the Milton Academy near Boston. But he never spent more than two years at any school that he attended, including Harvard. He had done some wartime service uh, in the Navy in the, in the um, in the Naval Department, and so the Harvard gave him two years of advanced credit, and he only did his junior and senior year at Harvard. The longest gig he ever had was at University U of Virginia. At law school at UVA. Uh, 
uh, he was an Irish American and an Irish Catholic American. What impact did that, might have that had on his sensitivity to the issues you addressed? Uh, you know, I, that, that's an issue we haven't obviously haven't touched on. Thank you for raising it. Uh, certainly, Kennedy, uh, John Kennedy, uh, faced uh, uh, much uh, trepidation about his presidential run based on the fact that he was the, would have been the, was the first Catholic president, and and uh, well, not the first uh, serious president, serious candidate. Uh, uh, the governor of New York, Al Smith, Al Smith uh, uh, faced serious backlash, anti-Catholic backlash in his campaign. You know, I suppose that's possible, but it, it, it's not something that you hear and you read, you, read the, you read the biographies. It's not something that Ramsey Clark talks about. It's not something Evan Thomas talks about. It's not something his peers talk about. I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Well, the, the person who really felt that bitterness was the father, Joe Kennedy. And he, as you know, he became a wealthy man uh, during the 1920s and 30s, partly um, in import-export business, <laughs> uh, but also um, in Hollywood. He became a Hollywood producer and, and, and made a lot of money, but he was routinely blackballed in New England, near Boston, for clubs, um, yacht clubs, golf clubs, etc., social organizations, and he actually moved the family to the Bronx when Robert Kennedy was just two because he was so appalled by the Brahmin aristocracy and the anti-Irish feeling in Boston. And he wore that chip on his shoulder for the rest of his life, which was one reason why when he was the ambassador to England, uh, he got crosswise with President Roosevelt by saying publicly that England was finished and that Hitler was not so bad. Uh, part of that was anti-British feeling because of his Irish anger. But John Kennedy had a little of it, and Robert Kennedy didn't have much. But, but the father again said, of all the, uh, the Irish in our family is in Bobby, and Bobby is the hater. He is the one that holds an Irish grudge longest. But he doesn't talk about that, I don't think, as one of the issues in his life. No. Uh, I can enlighten you a little bit about 19, when John F. Kennedy won the presidency by about 112,000 votes. I'm Catholic, and being Catholic then was a big handicap, because as you say, Al Smith lost. They never thought a Catholic could win. Now it's almost an advantage to be Catholic. However, uh, I'm here because I luckily, Clay, I'll talk to you more. I got all these pictures. I happened to run into the campaign in 19, uh, when John F. Kennedy won. I was about from here to closer when he spoke in Providence, Rhode Island. And then I had, I'm a dentist, and I had some classmates in Boston, and they were all Republicans. And, they said, if you're such a Kennedy freak, you ought to go down to Hyannisport, which I did. I was on the lawn. There was some young girls that lived there. And uh, we were the first Americans to greet the president-elect. They'd wave at us from the window. And Bobby, come out. And I said, Bobby, can I take your picture? And I had a Rico camera. In those days, you had to cock them. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, Bobby, can I take your picture? And there was a, a couple of young girls that lived there, so they guided me. And he uh, responded as such, yeah, make it snappy because I've got some phone calls to make. <laughs> but he couldn't have been more patient. He stood there. I got that picture. I donated him here. And then I stood with him, but I forgot to cock it. So, so I didn't mind that so much, but and the little dog, Charlie, ran out. But it was one of the most exhilarating things. I've seen a lot of things in my life. And uh, I have a son who's an attorney in Las Vegas, and I named him Robert Francis. <laughs> and uh, I took a picture, Clay, in uh, Fargo in 68 when he came on that campaign just two months before he died. Hmm. I, in those days, I had a Polaroid. I, I was so close, I had to back up. And uh, my son has those pictures in his office. And the last thing I'll say is that last call, uh, maybe you, my late brother was national committeeman in 1968 in the riots in Chicago and whatnot. And uh, his friend from South Dakota, from what I heard was, Bobby called him from the hotel, uh, Ambassador Hotel in L.A., and thanked him for the South Dakota win. Mm. 
And if he's still alive, I was going to always have my brother uh, tell me about him. My brother's gone too, but it would be fun to research to see if that committee man is living in South Dakota because I think he was the last man to talk to him on the phone. Mm -hmm. And that's all I got to well, say. We definitely want to see those photographs. And I know you've been in contact with Kim Jondo and they're digitized and but it's wonderful that you have them. Too bad you didn't have a digital camera. So, yeah. so that, uh, uh, just, and as, uh, just as I noticed as well, I, I think, I believe Dr. Gipp has brought with uh, some of the uh, artifacts or the, 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 the uh, newspaper front pages from the Bismarck Tribune during the NCAI meeting and, and Dr. Kennedy, or uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy's visit, as well as some of the original artwork from that conference. I saw some of this stuff at the UTTC Tribal Leaders Summit a couple of weeks ago. It's fantastic. If you get a chance, make sure you check that out. Very interesting. A few more if there are. I just wanted to mention uh, that I was very much involved in the trip that Bobby Kennedy made to Bismarck in 1963. I was one of the two officers of the Burley County Bar Association who was asked by Robert Moses, who was the son of Governor Moses, who was handling this trip for the tribe, for the, for the Indian people here. And he, I was working with him. And they, uh, apparently the Attorney General's office in Washington decided they needed more than, than another Indian program for him to fly out, so they got uh, recruited a legal association, our local bar association, and we met him at the airport at noon and came in for a, beer, a noon luncheon, and I can tell you that I've never been to the, to the uh, municipal, uh, 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 come on, the municipal uh, place over here. Municipal Country Club. Country Club. Country Club. There's that many people from down on Griffin Avenue all the way, ladies all the way through, standing in line three, four deep on both sides of the street to greet Bobby Kennedy as he came to speak. And I must say that his, his topic, to our, speech, to our group at that time, the, the country club was full of lawyers, uh, was simply the, the subject that you're talking about today, yeah. very simply. Yeah, the, the schedule itself, which we've, Kim Jondal rec re recovered, is to arrive at the airport, address an informal, at 4 o'clock, address an informal joint Burley County State Bar Association at Municipal Country Club, 40, 4.45 to 5 o'clock, visit Arts and Crafts Show at World War Memorial Building, 5 o'clock, public reception at World War Memorial Building, 5.45, the press conference at the Governor's Mansion, private meeting with Governor Guy, that's the longest. Uh, that's the longest time frame on the on the agenda. Eight o'clock address to the NCAI. Nine thirty. Nine thirty. Depart Bismarck for Washington. I wonder what time you got home. It's a long flight at that time. Do we so need to uh, to focus more on a respect for all life? The recent uh, violence that we see uh, so happening so often, and the war on terrorism. Doesn't that suggest uh, that we respect? Uh, we have a focus on all life rather than just these select groups? Well, I, I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think the point that we're making here is that, that civil rights are, 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 or at least the point I'm trying to make, uh, is that civil rights are, are broader than, than, than uh, uh, these individual rights that we think about in these cases. Um, and so we focus on, on uh, 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 giving everyone the chance uh, to, to reach their potential. So yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. Thank you. You know, the biographers talk about how this happened, and nobody really knows how he became fascinated by Native American culture. So we've chosen this sub subject because it seemed interesting to us, and this is the 50th anniversary of, of uh, the Attorney General's visit to, um, to Bismarck to give that talk. But you know, you can, I think you can really say that he, although he had already begun to work on Native American issues as the AG, that this was possibly the first moment when he really came alive to this issue and that Bismarck has a place in the history of this extraordinary moral arc in his life. You know, we, no, no biographer has shown what happened before this except administrative things within the Justice Department and the Kennedys were famously unwilling to put on hats. Mm -hmm. um, John Kennedy on the day of his death refused to put on a Stetson that was given to him in, Washington, in, in Dallas, he said, I'll, I'll wear it next Monday if you come up to Washington, I'll show you. Right. They hated hats, right. and the fact that Robert Kennedy would allow himself to be... Um, the headdress placed to, on. What an, what an honor, and it, and it showed his immediate understanding of the respect he needed to show to Native culture. Yeah. There's one over here. I had a question bringing us up to 2013. Do you, either one of you, see national leadership around bringing awareness 
about Native American issues and the whole need to raise awareness about their culture and all of that that Bobby Kennedy was trying to do. Is there any leader that you see or, or that is on the future that Bobby. would be another person like Bobby Kennedy tried to be in his short period of time in that effort? Well, let me start, and, and Tim knows much more about this than I do. I mean, he, that's just a very, we're trying to, I think we're trying to suggest that this is an, a very unusual story. But the good news is that since then, Native peoples have taken on their own leadership, and so the leadership has, has, has ceased to be right. a paternalistic, right. even a well-meaning paternalistic leadership, and has moved more into the Native American community. I think Dr. Giff will talk further about that, but Byron Dorgan, the former senator from North Dakota, made Native cultures and Native rights issues one of the principal issues of his time in Congress, and again, he, he did not have to do that. That's right. something he, he wanted to do. He's still doing it now that he's a former United States Senator. And, uh, uh, and, and Clay is right. I mean, the, the leaders for Native people uh, in the, in the self-determination area are, are the tribal leaders, the tribal council members, the tribal judges, the tribal prosecutors. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I will say that in honor and to commemorate uh, the 50th anniversary of, of Sen uh, Attorney General Kennedy's speech here in Bismarck, then in October, uh, Attorney General of the United States Eric Holder will speak to the National Congress of American Indians meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, so uh, I believe that uh, 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 Attorney General Holder uh, uh, and my fellow U.S. attorneys in this administration uh, are, are folks that are attempting to uh, help raise awareness uh, of the issues involved here. I think the Attorney General in Tulsa is going to talk about uh, the last four years and, and some of the progress that's been made. There is ways to go. But we, do not, we don't talk anymore about, you know, what are we going to do to solve these problems. We talk about partnerships, tribal partnerships with the U.S. Attorney's Office, U.S. Attorney's Office working with tribal prosecutors, uh, uh, working as partners with those who live in the community who have that vested interest and the knowledge and expertise and skill to solve those problems. We can't solve the problems. No one's going to solve the problems or the challenges at Fort Yates from Bismarck. And we're certainly not going to solve those problems in Washington. It has to be a partnership with the tribe, the people who live there, those communities, empowering them, working with them to move the ball down the field. I know that you would you'd be too modest to say this, but that fact that the Attorney General is going to go to Tulsa oh boy, don't <laughs> is something that you made happen. You, you suggested it. And you have brought this commemoration to its 50th anniversary in Tulsa coming up in October. I certainly have talked a lot about the speech 50 years ago. I'll leave it at oh, that. Oh, come on. You know. <laughs> Any others? Any other questions? We have about three minutes left. I think we've done it. Let me read one more piece here. That's just so wonderful. This is, um, this is about the difference between John Kennedy and after whose death Robert Kennedy was able to emerge. Um, this is Evan Thomas. In such moments, he's touring a, a barrio. There are hints of the moral crusader that Robert Kennedy would become in his own right, reaching far beyond the cautious and real politique of JFK. For someone defined all of his life by family duty, who subordinated his own ambition and ego for the sake of his brothers, the death of JFK was a cause for more than sorrow. Robert Kennedy would have to redefine himself. Robert Kennedy's tortured self-examination during these years, his search for redemption and identity, would become all consuming. And let me just remind you, Tim, of the eulogy that Ted Kennedy gave um, in New York for the, at the funeral of, of Robert Kennedy. And it's one of the greatest eulogies in modern American history, and, and I'll just quote a little piece of it, but he said something that encapsulates everything that I think you've been saying here. He said, my brother need not be idealized, nor enlarged in death beyond what he was in life, but be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, who saw suffering and tried to heal it, who saw war and tried to stop it. Uh, those of us who loved him and take him to his rest today pray that what he was for us and what he wished for others will someday come to pass for all the world. As he said many times in many parts of this country to those he touched and those who sought to touch him, 
Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. And Ted Kennedy got it right. Yep, absolutely. Hey.